Welcome to the story of LaRue Spiker and Louise Gilbert and their very courageous activism during the civil rights era. I'm Carolyn Gage and I'm going to be giving a presentation about LaRue and Louise who were residents of Southwest Harbor here in Maine for the last 35 years of their lives from 1960 until the mid-1990s. I first ran across LaRue Spiker's name in the fall of 2016 when I first moved to Mount Desert Island. I was reading through the old issues of the Mount Desert Island uh, Historical Society Journal and I saw an article on LaRue by a British student named Elizabeth Redhead who visited the island in 2001. And this is the picture that first caught my attention. LaRue would have been an adolescent and what caught my eye was the sense of self-possession, rare for anyone, but especially a teenaged girl in the 1920s. Intrigued, I read the article. Redhead's article talked about LaRue and her life partner Louise Gilbert's participation in the Wade House bombing in Louisville in 1954, and I was stunned by the courage and heroism of these two women. So that is why I wanted to give this talk. LaRue first came to the island in the summer of 1957. She was 45. Living out of a camper, she stayed in a campground in Bar Harbor. For three years, she would spend her summers on the island and her winters in Florida. In 1960, she moved here permanently, building a log home in Southwest Harbor. Eventually, her partner Louise Gilbert also moved to Southwest Harbor living in a house next door to LaRue's. LaRue was a professional writer, publishing a number of freelance articles in the Bar Harbor Times. In 1962, she was appointed editor. After two years, she resigned over conflicts with the publisher. She continued to write articles for the paper and to do publicity for the Bar Harbor Chamber of Commerce. And she also became an accomplished photographer. She was deeply involved in environmental activism on the island, and the organizations to which she belonged included the League of Women Voters, the Southwest Harbor Conservation Commission, the Natural Resources Council of Maine, the Audubon Society, and Down East Animal Welfare. In her 70s, she took to the road again, traveling around the country. She died at home in 1995 at the age of 83, one year after the death of her life partner, Louise. Lots of dogs. If you go to the Mount Desert Island Historical Society's Spiker Papers, you will see lots of dog photographs. So many dogs. It's a wonderful archive and it has a lot of her papers, but none about the Wade House bombing. I suspect that those are in another archive in Louisville. And I'm very sorry to say that I was unable to locate any photographs of Louise Gilbert. This is a photo of the bench in front of the Harbor House here in Southwest Harbor that is dedicated to LaRue Spiker. Here's a photo of the plaque that's on the bench. It reads, In memory of LaRue Spiker who did so much for our town. She and her partner Louise also did so much for our nation. And that's what I want to talk about with this presentation. In 1954, in Louisville, Kentucky, an African-American man named Andrew Wade wanted to buy a new house for his family. It was in a segregated neighborhood, so he enlisted the support of a white ally, Carl Braden, to purchase the home and then turn around and sell it to him. This resulted in a wave of violence that culminated in the house being bombed. During this campaign to drive a black family out of their home, LaRue and Louise came forward with three others to support the family by standing guard at the house. They would be indicted by a grand jury for sedition, facing the very real possibility of 21 years in prison and $20,000 in fines. So I am now telling the story of the Wade House bombing and of LaRue and Louise's part in this piece of civil rights history. This is a photo of Charlotte, Andrew, and Rosemary Wade in front of their new Louisville house after their windows were smashed by rocks. Charlotte is seven months pregnant. The Wade House bombing in 1954 in Louisville was the tipping point for housing discrimination in the civil rights movement. 
The bombing happened one week before the Supreme Court ruling on Brown v. Board of Education, striking down the idea of separate but equal education. It happened one year before the lynching of young Emmett Till, and it happened a year and a half before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a segregated bus. LaRue and Louise supported the Wades at a pivotal moment in U.S. history. A few years earlier, and the two women would have been sent to prison for 21 years. A few years later, and they never would have been indicted at all. Housing in America, a nation of immigrants, has always been a fraught issue. So let's take a look at that. In 1917, the Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional for states to pass laws to segregate housing. So then communities just began to adopt restrictive covenants, agreements not to sell to so-called outsiders. Then in 1948, the Supreme Court ruled that these agreements, these restrictive covenants, could not be legally enforced. But even though they were illegal, people still found ways to enforce them. Realtors could tell the buyer of color that there was already a sale pending or just choose not to show them the property at all. This was easier to do before the days of the Internet. Lenders could and did refuse mortgages to people of color if they were trying to buy in certain neighborhoods. This is what happened to the Wades. In the United States and in Canada, this process was called redlining. The phrase was coined in 1960 to describe areas where banks would not invest money. The definition has expanded to this, quote, a system of denial of various services to residents of specific, often racially associated neighborhoods or communities, either directly or through the selective raising of prices. If major stores or healthcare facilities are far away from a neighborhood, that will have the effect of redlining it. These are some of the ways that whites can maintain a color line in the cities. Another thing that white people do is form neighborhood associations to buy back houses from people of color. A week after the Wades moved in, the developer approached him with a buyback offer. There's also economic and social pressure. Andrew Wade's electrical company lost a substantial amount of uh, white corporate business after he moved into a white neighborhood. The milkman and the mailman refused to deliver to the Wade house. Realtors who sold houses to people of color in segregated neighborhoods could be fined by boards of realtors or even lose their membership in professional realty organizations. And then when all else fa failed, there was always terrorism. This is a bombed house from Birmingham, Alabama. In the 1950s, there were so many bombings in Birmingham that the city was nicknamed Bombingham. The Wades and their allies, like LaRue and Louise, received hundreds of threatening phone calls all hours of the night and day. Allies lost their jobs and their friends. Family turned against family. People would park outside the Wade home, throw rocks through the window, shoot guns into the house. They burned a cross in the next yard. And the police were under political pressure not to make any arrests. As we will see, the white man who bought the house to sell to the Wades went to prison. This issue of housing segregation crops up over and over in U.S. history at different times and in different geographical areas. And the target population also varies. Now, this is a sign from the Civil Rights era. And here's one from 1892. And this is one from 1917. And from the 1940s. And this is a sign from today. And today, gentrification is the new redlining. Gentrification is defined as the process of renovating and improving a house or district so that it conforms to middle class taste. First, the landlord buys a building or a bunch of houses, and then the landlord has to get rid of the working class tenants by raising the rent. If there is rent control, then the landlord just stops fixing things like heat, and the tenants have to take them to court often over and over again. A landlord can make life hell for the tenants. And then when the buildings are finally empty, they renovate them, turn them into condos, etc., and charge rents that only upper middle class folks can afford. And this is happening in New York and San Francisco, and it's also happening here on Mount Desert Island. 
and especially in Bar Harbor. Landlords are buying up property for Airbnb rentals and locals are having a hard time finding affordable housing. The majority of developers responsible for gentrification are white and the majority of people who move into the gentrified neighborhoods are white and middle class. And here's another sign for today. As this sign notes, one in four American youth will be homeless the day they come out. And that's another way that housing can be used for social control. But anyway, let's get back to the Wade House bombing and what led up to it. The bombing took place in Louisville, and Louisville is in Kentucky. The city is called the Gateway to the South because Kentucky is a border state between the North and the South. Louisville in the 1950s was like the proverbial glass, half full or half em empty depending on how you looked at it. Certainly it was better on civil rights than the deep south states like Alabama and Mississippi, but compared with other border cities like Springfield, Illinois, or Washington, D.C., or Cincinnati, not so much. Louisville, as noted, had one foot in the north and one foot in the south, and this kind of gave it a split personality in terms of civil rights. In the early 1800s, Louisville was a slave city and a slave state, but its commercial economy was tied to trade with the North, so when the Civil War broke out, Kentucky voted to stay in the Union and fight with the Yankees. But there's a saying about Kentucky that they seceded from the Union after the surrender at Appomattox meaning that after the war, Kentucky began to identify more and more with the southern states. By 1895, Louisville had gone so far as to erect a Confederate war memorial. And then in the era of Jim Crow, which set in afterwards, there was segregation, theaters, sports facilities, schools, and hospitals. But, and here's the gateway part, unlike most southern states, Louisville had always had integrated public transit, but then again, they still had segregated waiting rooms at the bus depot. Also, Louisville never had poll taxes or other voter restrictions that Southern states devised to keep African Americans from voting. Louisville's black electorate could vote, and they did vote, in percentages just slightly lower than that of the white electorate. Also, by the 1950s, the major papers were against segregation, and so were most of the churches and the unions, but they pretty much agreed that the process of integration should be careful and steady. And by that, these citizens meant that the initiative needed to come from white people. Black people like Andrew Wade were not to take it upon themselves to, quote, force the issue, end quote. In other words, white Southern liberals believed there was a right way to integrate and a wrong way. And that is why there was so little support for the Wade family and their white allies like LaRue and Louise. And here's a photo of downtown Louisville in 1954. This is a postcard of four hospitals in Louisville. In 1950, three African-American men were involved in a serious car accident in Louisville. Taken to a local hospital, they lay on the floor of the emergency room for three hours. Like all the hospitals in Louisville, this one did not admit African-Americans. The men were not even given a blanket. One of the men died on the floor. The other two were finally picked up by a black ambulance company that came from 70 miles away to take them to an out-of-town hospital that would admit people of color. This sparked the interracial hospital movement in Louisville. It involved students, churches, and civil rights organizations who gathered petitions and lobbied for legislation to desegregate the hospitals. After two years, a law was passed that any hospital refusing emergency services to African Americans would lose their license. Some of these hospitals began to admit non-emergency patients of color. It would take several more years before hospital staffs would desegregate. The point here is that Louisville was not just on the border, but it was also on the fence. Here are some more examples of fence sitting. In 1951, there was a big movement to get the city to stop listing their jobs as black or white, and that change took three years. There was persistent pressure for the Louisville phone company to hire African Americans. So in 1956, they interviewed scores of black women, but they didn't hire any. The black community fought back by paying their phone bill in pennies. In 
And another example of fence sitting, the city parks were all privately owned and therefore legally segregated. But the amphitheater in the big city park had been paid for with taxes, so it was not allowed to discriminate. And this led to a situation where an African-American family could sit side by side with white people at an event at the amphitheater, but they could not sit 100 feet away from white people in the surrounding park to have a picnic. Before Brown versus Board of Education, Louisville tried to have separate but equal swimming pools. But when it came to golf courses, they had a problem. There was no separate golf course for blacks, so they would either have to build one or integrate the existing ones. What they did was they integrated. This same practice was applied to universities. If there was a field of study like law that was not being offered at the black colleges, then the state or the city would have to fund creation of a separate program or else integrate the white college programs. So the universities were integrating piecemeal, one program at a time. But the public schools, restaurants, theaters, hotels, jobs, and housing remained segregated. Blacks could shop in all the stores, but they could not try on clothing in the dressing rooms. Housing was the biggest issue. Why? Because housing was about social integration. It was about hanging out in your neighbor's kitchen, raising your children together, having them grow up socializing and dating, and marrying and having biracial children. This was the line in the sand in the 1950s, even among many liberals. The unions would support equal job opportunities. Nobody wanted to see anyone die on the floor of an emergency room, and certainly a university education should be accessible to those who wanted it. But housing was the sticking point, and housing is where LaRue Spiker and Louise Gilbert enter the story. So let's take some time to look at the housing in Louisville in the mid-1950s. This is a contemporary map of Louisville. The bulge that follows the curve of the Ohio River is called the West End of Louisville. This was traditionally the black neighborhood and you can still see today how it's considered the less desirable housing. On this map, the areas of the West End have been categorized as green, blue, yellow, and red. The red and the yellow are the least desirable, the poorest neighborhoods, the slums. Now the right-hand side of the map shows um, has a different color scheme going on, uh, and it shows an area further away from the downtown area, more suburban. And here the colors represent areas where mortgages are most frequently refused. And notice the further out the suburbs, the higher the percentage of refused mortgages. Uh, the dark, um, the kind of orange colored areas is the area where 85% of the mortgages are refused. These desirable areas are kept exclusive by refusing mortgages to the lower income buyers. Maps like these are used by realtors to control who can buy houses and where and they are still used today. Again, this is Louisville today, green for African American residents, orange for whites. The West End is still the part of the city with the most concentrated African American population. Integrated neighborhoods are happening, but much of the 1950s demographics remain the same. So let's talk about the Wades, a young family. There's a daughter, two, and Charlotte Wade, who's seven months pregnant. The Wade family is expanding and they are looking to move out of their apartment and into a bigger house. In fact, there are a ton of these new fancy houses being built outside the city. This is the post-war boom. They're called ranch houses and split levels, and the kitchens are large with all the post-war modern conveniences like dishwashers and laundry rooms. And there are trees and big yards lots of room for the kids to grow and it's safe it's not in the city everybody knows their neighbors and the schools are better so this is where the wades want to buy but these houses are outside the area redlined for black housing the west end so uh, before we look at uh, the suburban houses let's look at the area where the wades were supposed to buy their home let's look at the west end in the 1950s here are some West End bungalows. And these are some larger West End homes, but older buildings, probably from the 1920s. Uh, 
They don't have room for a dishwasher in the kitchen. They have stairs. That's tough on a pregnant woman, tough on small children. And of course, they're in the city. There's traffic. There's strangers. And the yards are smaller, if they have yards at all. The ranch houses are sounding better and better. Oh, and here's another typical West End house. But this one is not for sale. There's a family already living there in 1954, the Clay family. They have a little boy, and he's 12 years old. There he is, and his name is Cassius, Cassius Clay. And here he is all grown up. Well, not really. He's still only 18. And he's just come back home with his gold medal in boxing from the 1960 Olympics. That's his family greeting him at the airport. His life is about to change in a few hours. Because that night, this big celebrity, the most famous person in Louisville, is going to go to a fancy restaurant with his family to celebrate his victory. And the restaurant won't seat them. Young Cassius walks down to the Ohio River that same night and he throws his Olympic gold medal in because, in his words, it didn't mean anything. And here's another picture of young Cassius Clay at 18. He's with some of his Olympic teammates who also won medals. One year from now, he's going to turn pro and change his name to Muhammad Ali, aligning himself with his African spiritual roots. Seven years later, Muhammad Ali refused to be drafted into the U.S. Army, and Louisville entered the story again. Ali told the press, Why should they ask me to put on a uniform and go 10,000 miles from home and drop bombs and bullets on brown people in Vietnam while so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs and denied simple human rights? But it's 1954, and he's still only 12. So let's get back to the Wade family and their search for housing. The newly built house they wanted was not to be found in the West End, so they began to look in the suburbs. In 1948, 80% of the land in Louisville was segregated. There were 20,000 new homes built after the war, but only 200 of these could be sold to blacks. And that just didn't make sense to Andrew Wade. So who exactly was Andrew Wade? And had Louisville's segregation affected him as much as it had Muhammad Ali? Andrew was a college-educated professional electrician. He worked for his father's company. He came from a middle-class family who were church and civic leaders. He was also a Navy veteran. In the service, he had entered a world where blacks and whites worked side by side, and like so many other veterans, he was not so willing to accept Jim Crow segregation when he got out. During his time in the service, while stationed in Seattle, he and his best friend tried to eat at a restaurant, but they could not get served. His friend refused to leave, and the police were called. Seven police officers threw Andrew's Navy buddy on the ground, and in Andrew's words, pumped him full of bullets. Andrew's wife, Charlotte, was not an activist like Andrew. She had learned that wherever there were white people, there was trouble. But Charlotte really had her heart set on a split-level house. She wanted her children to have the best. One of the earliest memories Andrew had was about the Fontaine Ferry Amusement Park that was located in the West End. As a child, he could see the Ferris wheel and the other rides when his father would drive past them. He would also see the posters for the park. He and his sisters kept pestering his father to take them there, and his father would always put them off, telling them that someday they would go. And one day when Andrew was five or six, he and his, sisters, his sister had had enough of the promises. They began to insist that today was the day. Finally, his father told them that he could not take them today or ever, because it was a park for white people only, and they were black. And Andrew remembers his father's reluctance and shame in that conversation. Later, when Wade was in the Naval Reserves, after he got out of the service, he was invited with the other members of the reserve to a picnic in Fontaine Ferry Park to commemorate the soldiers who died in World War II fighting for democracy. An hour into the picnic, his commanding officer took Andrew and the other black reservists aside and told them that there had been a mistake. 
and that they needed to respect local customs and leave. Andrew wrote that he was ashamed to be wearing the uniform of the U.S. Navy, and he resigned immediately. Andrew Wade wanted a different life for his children. He wanted to be doing something proactive to break down the segregation that was so hurtful and that made no sense. So he and Charlotte went looking for their dream house outside the West End. Let's take a look at these 1950s ranch houses. Well, here's one of them. And here's another one. No second floor. And look at that beautiful front yard. And the shade tree and all that space in the back. They can get a dog for the kids and a swing set and a picnic table. And they can let the kids play outside without having to keep an eye on them because everybody in the suburbs knows each other and all that parking. So after many months of house hunting, this is the house that the Wades finally chose. This is a contemporary photo. At the time when the Wades bought the house, it was in a development surrounded by empty lots, and there was even a leftover barn in the field behind the house. So here we see another map of Louisville with that bulging west end, and then way down below it, that red blip that's the Wade house. You can see how far from the west end this was. And by the way, just above the word Louisville, there's a little green blip on the map. That's the factory where they make the famous Louisville Slugger baseball bats. The Wade house was in a brand new all-white housing development. Andrew Wade had already tried to buy houses like this. In fact, one realtor actually was going to sell to him until he saw that Andrew had put Negro down on the paperwork. The realtor thought Andrew was Latino because of his light skin, but when he saw that Andrew was African American, he tore up the papers. So Andrew knew he was going to have to find another way to buy a ranch house for his family. But before we move into that story, we're going to take a little side trip because the Wade House bombing wasn't just about Jim Crow and segregation. This was 1954, and it was also very much about McCarthyism and the communist witch hunts, and also what would later be called the Lavender Scare. In 1950, Republicans were desperate. They had been out of power for 18 years since the defeat of Hoover by Roosevelt. Roosevelt, with his wildly popular New Deal, had won four terms. He had seen the country through the Depression and led the country to victory in World War II. After his presidency, the Republicans and the rest of the country were so sure the Republican candidate was going to win that the newspapers had run the headline, Dewey Defeats Truman, and still the Democratic candidate came from behind and won. How could the Republicans find a way to win? Part of the problem was that under Roosevelt, the nation had seen the banning of child labor, the minimum wage, the 40-hour work week, workman's compensation, unemployment insurance, employer-provided health insurance, welfare, social security, and new work programs to create jobs. How can you make people think those are bad things? So the Republicans were desperate, but finally in 1950 they found their issue. On February 9, 1950, Republican Senator Joe McCarthy stood up and told a crowd that the United States State Department was, quote, thoroughly infested with communists, end quote, and he brandished papers he, he claimed were a list of such subversives. This is what he said. I have here in my hand a list of 205 State Department employees that were known to the Secretary of State as being members of the Communist Party and who nevertheless are still working and shaping the policy of the State Department. In fact, no one ever saw the list, and McCarthy never produced any solid evidence there was even one communist in the State Department, but that didn't matter. The speech struck a nerve in the American people. It triggered an avalanche of headlines and a flood of letters. The Republicans had, after almost 20 years, found their issue. At the time of McCarthy's speech, communism was a significant concern in the United States. This concern was exacerbated by the actions of the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, the victory of the communists in the Chinese Civil War, and the Soviets' development of a nuclear weapon the year before. 
But McCarthy wasn't just going after communists in the government. On April 19, 1950, the Republican national chairman said that, quote, sexual perverts who have infiltrated our government in recent years were perhaps as dangerous as the actual communists, end quote. The danger was perceived as not solely because they were perverts. Homosexuals were considered to be more susceptible to blackmail and were labeled as security risks. McCarthy hired Roy Cohn, who would later die of AIDS and was considered a closeted homosexual, as chief counsel of his congressional subcommittee. Together, McCarthy and Cohn, with the enthusiastic support of the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, another closeted gay man, were responsible for the firing of scores of gay men and women from government employment and they strong-armed many opponents into silence using rumors of their homosexuality. McCarthy conflated communism with being gay, and that is where we got the expression pinko commie. He said there was something mentally or physically twisted about anyone in the Communist Party. He said homosexuality was a psychological maladjustment that led people to communism. The Lavender Scare was inextricably tied to the Red Scare of the 1950s. It was the result of this belief that homosexuals posed a risk to national security and needed to be systematically removed from the federal government. What started out as a partisan political weapon became a national moral panic that lasted throughout the 1950s. It was a 25-year policy that ruined many lives, and it came very close to ruining that of La Rue and Louise. It's true that Washington had been very gay-friendly. Prior to McCarthy in 1950, lots of gay and lesbian folks came for the civil service jobs. Why? Because the federal government did not discriminate. They used merit-based testing. This is a picture of a civil service exam being given. Women especially could get jobs beyond nurse, secretary, and teacher. There was no old boys network for hiring, but just civil service exams. All the jobs were classified and filled by competitive examination. In the 1930s and 40s, Washington was a boom town with the New Deal. Population of the city doubled in 20 years, from 1930 to 1950. The New Deal created the first large sexually integrated white-collar bureaucracy in the United States. These jobs provided better security in the eyes of many women than a husband. Civil service exams had erased lines of gender and color and age, causing a breakdown of all the hierarchies of so-called civilization. But many people were fearful that a femocracy was being created where lesbianism would be rampant. There was a panic that women were invading traditional male space and doing the work of men, and that men were not manly anymore. Washington was becoming full of intellectuals, social science folks, economists, statisticians, eggheads, men with long hair and women with short hair. Civil servants administering social welfare programs were seen as prying into people's lives. The balance of power was shifting away from Congress. Suddenly there were all these unelected specialists versus the elected generalists. Who was running the government? Often these specialists were better educated with higher class backgrounds than members of Congress. This hysteria was linked to prejudice against the New Deal where Roosevelt's social programs were seen as taking away people's personal responsibility and ruining the souls of millions, emasculating the men and masculinizing the women. The anti-communist slogan was, quote, when the state becomes God, morals disappear, end quote. Stable, monogamous, heterosexual marriages were seen as a key weapon in the arsenal against degeneracy and internal communist subversion. In 1953, Democratic candidate Adlai Stevenson ran against Dwight Eisenhower. Republicans pursued a relentless, untrue, but successful rumor campaign to frame Stevenson, who was a bachelor, as a gay man. J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI was especially active in this campaign. Eisenhower won the election and the Republicans were finally back in power. In April 1953, President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed Executive Order 10450, which set security standards for federal employment and barred homosexuals from working in the federal government. 
he ordered government agencies to fire all those, quote, guilty of sexual perversion, end quote. The executive order was the cause for the firing of approximately 5,000 gay and lesbians from the federal employment. This included private contractors and military personnel. Not only did the victims lose their jobs, but also they were forced out of the closet and thrust into the public eye as lesbian or gay. Finally, Republicans were in power. and They set about cleaning house. It wasn't just military and state department, though, but all branches of the federal government. And it wasn't just political loyalty, but so-called proper morals. Sexual perversion was specifically named along with addiction. It was the first time this was made explicit. Once a person was investigated, they had to be either cleared or discharged. There was no in-between. Eighty percent of investigations resulted in a confession. Failure to answer charges was taken as admission of guilt. Investigators would threaten to contact family, other employers, and so on. Anonymous letters started pouring in. The witch hunts spread to international organizations, too, as well as the Foreign Service and the United Nations. State and municipal employees were required to take loyalty tests and to submit to investigations. Members of the gay subculture were assumed to have loyalty to one another that transcended class, race, and nation. Quote, by the very nature of their vice, homosexuals belong to a sinister, mysterious, and efficient international. End quote. Social promiscuity, which meant dating across class lines, would attract them to communist philosophies about a so-called classless society. People believed there was a global homosexual community, especially in the literary and artistic worlds, comic strips, radio, TV films. Being gay or lesbian was considered a psychological maladjustment that would affect political, sexual, and cultural stances. But homosexuality was also framed as a moral problem. Communism was seen as hostile to traditional families and promoting of free love. Strong professional women who used the state-run child care were evidence of the state's antipathy toward the patriarchal family. And all of this is very ironic because Stalin had mass arrests of gay people, seeing it as a form of bourgeois decadence. It seems that we were everybody's scapegoat. LaRue had already been a victim of these witch hunts before she moved to Kentucky. In 1950, when LaRue was a social worker in, in Indianapolis, she and another social worker were stopped when they were going door to door on a campaign for nuclear disarmament, and they were stopped by the police. It's important to remember the horror of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were just five years in the past, and there was an international movement for nuclear disarmament. But in 1950, nuclear disarmament was seen in the U.S. as a Soviet plot to weaken America. And because of LaRue's membership in a number of organizations that were on the State Department watch list, she and the other woman campaigning with her lost their government jobs. LaRue may also have been suspected of being lesbian as a single older woman, neither divorced or widowed, and gender nonconforming. It's likely she was a victim of the Lavender Scare as well as the communist witch hunts. The fact she was a member of the Civil Rights Congress, a civil rights organization, was damning because in the 1950s, white people who were allies to African Americans were seen as part of a Soviet conspiracy to stir up a race war in America. LaRue was blacklisted for government employment. This is what prompted her to move to Louisville. This previous history would come back to haunt her when she was indicted for sedition after the Wade House bombing. So here is a copy of the telegram ordering her into the office. And it's also on the bottom half. This is a petition she, she circulated in the neighborhood where she had been going door to door. It was returned to her with a nasty note typed on it, which reads, Fooey on you and this bunch of baloney. Why don't you go over and preach it to Joe Stalin after you sell him this idea? We might listen, but not before. We hope you're being fired, and we approve you're being fired, and we hope you stay fired. In the 25 years of this witch hunt, the government never found a single instance of a homosexual having been blackmailed. But in 1950, the government continued to promote the myth that we posed a security risk. Between 1947 and 1950, 400 resigned or were terminated. This quadrupled by 1953. Thousands had lost jobs by 1960. 
Many resigned or were not recorded for reasons of sexuality, so it's difficult to calculate the breadth of the purge, but everybody was afraid. The practice was taken up in the business world. Private investigative agencies sprang up, often with former FBI agents, and they even interrogated students on fellowships. Sadly, many people who were targets of these communist-slash-homosexual witch hunts killed themselves as a result of the firing, the public shaming, the government contacting family members, and so on. When this happened, the government would cover it up. This fellow, Andy Ference, was an overseas government worker. The purging of homosexuals from the workplace didn't end until 1969, long after our story of LaRue and Louise and the Wade House bombing. Frank Kameny was the man who ended it. He was a veteran and an astronomer with a degree from Harvard who was fired from the U.S. Army's Army Map Service in Washington. He was fired for homosexuality and then blacklisted. There's not too many jobs for an astronomer outside the government. He appealed twice and he lost twice. And then he realized he had nothing left to lose, so he began to organize. He began the first national protest movement specifically to challenge government policy. This is a protest in D.C. in 1965. Note the suits and the ties. Many protesters were government workers. That's lesbian activist Barbara Giddings out in front. Kemeny's organization signaled the beginning of the movement for lesbian gay rights, and by 1969 the witch hunting was over. But that was in the future. We are talking about 1954 in Louisville. LaRue, blacklisted in Indiana, moved to Louisville, where she became partners with and moved in with Louise Gilbert, a friend she had known from college. The two women shared an apartment. Blacklisted LaRue could not get a job as a social worker. For three years, she worked on the production line in a flower factory in Louisville. That's flour as in wheat, becoming the president of the union there. Louise was uh, a social worker, and she also worked for the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom, an organization founded in 1915 by Jane Addams to further the cause of world peace and freedom. The WILPF was on the FBI watch list, because it was international and it was pacifist. But let's get back to our story. Andrew Wade was looking for a white ally to buy his house in an all-white neighborhood. And the allies he picked were Carl and Ann Braden. So the Bradens. Carl was a working class union man born and raised in Louisville. When he was eight years old, his father's union went out on strike and Carl's family was unable to afford food. When he grew up, he became a journalist covering labor issues. And Ann Braden was a deeply religious, upper-middle-class journalist from Alabama. They both shared a passion for social justice. At the time when Andrew approached them, they'd been married for six years and had two children. Ann was two months pregnant with their third child. The saying is that police reporters end up drunks, cynics, or reformers. The Bradens had become reformers. Andrew asked them because he and his father had done wiring for the Braden's home, and he also knew them from their participation in progressive organizations. And here they are with their kids. Anne had been involved in that successful movement to desegregate the hospitals in Louisville. She didn't think buying and then reselling a house to the Wades was going to be that big a deal, but it was. This is the deed of sale from the Bradens to Andrew Wade. It's going to be an exhibit in the criminal trial. And this is Andrew's first mortgage deposit, another exhibit in the trial. So here is the timeline. On Monday, May 10th, 1954, Carl Braden buys the house from the white developer who built it. On Thursday, May 13th, three days later, Carl sells it to Andrew. On Friday, May 14th, the next day, Andrew and Charlotte start to move in. The developer, who lives across the street, comes over to see if they are renting. Andrew tells him, no, he is the owner. The developer throws a fit, and pretty soon 20 cars are parked outside the house. At midnight, a mob of people show up at Carl's home and threaten him. On Saturday, May 15th, the next day, a rock is thrown through the Wade house window with a threatening note. 
That night, a cross is burned in the lot next door to them, and a shotgun is fired into the home, just missing the Wades. On Sunday, May 16th, the black community starts the Wade Defense Committee to offer the Wades financial and legal help and security for their home. Volunteers show up to keep a 24-hour watch on the house. This is where Louise and LaRue come in. They are among the volunteers helping to guard the family. Louise has the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom draft a letter that they distribute to all the homes in the neighborhood. Later on, the grand jury will tear this letter apart. LaRue and Louise sit up in the Wade's living room all night watching for cars that might drive by. They could be shot at any time. On Monday, one week later, the Supreme Court rules on Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Segregation in the schools is illegal. The entire country goes crazy. This ruling heightens white people's panic about integrated neighborhoods. On May 18th, the big Louisville paper comes out with an editorial stating that the neighbors are within their rights to protest the presence of the Wades because deceit was practiced on them. It blames the Bradens. The paper says that Andrew Wade made an understandable error, but the Bradens made an inexcusable blunder. The word inexcusable was licensed for violence. This was the paper Carl worked for. On May 20th, the local neighborhood paper suggests the sale of the home was part of a communist plot by the Bradens. On May 21st, the insurance on the house is canceled because there's a clause that Carl needed the lender's approval before he resold the house. Nobody will sell Andrew Wade insurance on the home because of the bombing threats. The mortgage is revoked and the Bradens challenge this legally. The black community rallies and a company is eventually located that will sell them insurance, but the money can't be released because the title is uncertain. Threats continue to both families. Anne Braden miscarries. On June 27th, six weeks later, a bomb rips through the house, destroying two bedrooms and a bathroom. The floor falls through and the walls of the rest of the house buckle. One of the bedrooms was Little Rosemary's. Fortunately, she was staying at a friend's home that night. The police tell people they have a confession, but no arrests are made. The Wade Defense Committee begins a campaign to get the police to do something. This is a picture that was taken right after the bombing. Summer comes and goes, still no indictments. Charlotte and Rosemary have moved in with Andrew's parents, but Andrew refuses to leave the house. The Wade Defense Committee is persistent in demanding action from law enforcement. Finally, in November, a grand jury is called to find out who set off the bomb and why. They take the position that the bomb was set off by the white people who were helping Andrew Wade. They don't question anyone else. They are trying to prove it was a communist plot to stir up race hatred. They don't go after the Wades. They see Andrew Wade was just a helpless victim of the communist plot. Digging up an obscure law passed by the state of Kentucky in the 1920s, a law that was never used and that most people had never heard of, they indict the Bradens and five of the people who were guarding the family, including LaRue and Louise. They are charged with criminal syndicalism and sedition against the governments of the United States and the Commonwealth of Kentucky. They face a penalty of up to 21 years in prison and a $10,000 fine. Everyone has to look up the word sedition. The grand jury looks for the person who planted the bomb. Carl was at work that night, so they couldn't arrest him for that. Anne is a woman, so they decide the bombing had been done by Vernon Bowen, a white man who had moved into the Wade home to guard the family during the day when Andrew was working. Uh, Vernon had a night job, so it made sense for him to move in. The jury could not get over a white man choosing to live in a black family's home. They kept asking him why he did it. No matter how many times he told them it was to protect the family. The homes of the defendants were raided, uh, looking for socialist or communist literature. Hundreds of books were seized from the Braden home. Einstein, Shakespeare, and any book by a Russian author, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and yes, some socialist books.
Vernon's roommate, a member of the Communist Party, actually had communist newspapers. The grand jury asked the defendants about their membership in organizations, Civil Rights Congress, NAACP, League of American Writers, Communist Party, did they read The Daily Worker? LaRue and Louise courageously refused to recognize the legitimacy of this grand jury at all, and they refused to even be sworn in. They are immediately arrested for contempt and locked up in jail for five days. LaRue's family and a friend of Louise bail them out. LaRue either quit or was fired from her job at the flower factory at this time. Later on, Louise and LaRue are subpoenaed again, and this time they go before the grand jury, but they plead the Fifth Amendment for all questions not directly related to the bombing. And so did the Bradens. Every defendant who refused to answer questions was indicted. No blacks were indicted because that would not fit the narrative that African Americans in the South are happy with Jim Crow. It is the white communists who are using them to stir up trouble to cause a race war and weaken the country. Anne and Carl Braden refused to answer all questions about their political activism, about the books and magazines they read, and the organizations they joined. They were arrested for contempt of court. The grand jury was really after the Bradens because they had sold the house in a white neighborhood to a black family. They were shunned by everyone in the community. Anyone showing support for the Bradens was immediately subpoenaed by the grand jury and at risk of indictment for sedition. Carl Braden was the first to go on trial. This is a picture of the jurors. All of them are white and only one of them is a woman. After 13 days of trial, on November 29th, Carl Braden is found guilty of violating the Kentucky law against sedition based on his library, his organizations, and one witness who claimed to be a spy for the FBI. I love the expression on Anne's face. Most of the 13 days were spent discussing the contents of the books in his library. Carl Braden is sentenced to 15 years in prison. The jury deliberated for three hours trying to decide whether he should be sentenced to 15 years or the full 21. His guilt was never in question. Carl's bail is set at $40,000, the highest bail ever set in Kentucky at that time. LaRue and Louise are also facing sedition charges. They are also facing long prison sentences, but they have special circumstances. In the 1950s, it was criminal to be lesbian. LaRue and Louise were middle-aged women living together. One of them worked for an organization on the government watch list. They were in jail for contempt of court, and they were being investigated for communist plotting. It's very likely they were identified as lesbians, and in the 1950s, lesbians were treated very harshly by the police, especially if they were jailed. Like the Bradens and the other defendants, LaRue and Louise had a history of association with socialist causes and organizations. Unlike the Bradens or the other defendants, LaRue had been fired and then blacklisted from her social career back in Indiana, and she and her, quote, roommate fit the profile for suspected lesbians. Lesbianism, criminal in 1954, was also considered a moral failing, a sexual perversion, and a sin against God and nature. It's important to remember that LaRue and Louise were likely to face questions about the nature of their relationship as two middle-aged women living together. That was part of the McCarthy playbook that the Louisville grand jury was following. LaRue and Louise's pictures were plastered all over the papers. They, too, were threatened, subjected to threatening phone calls and letters. I want to stress their extreme courage as marginalized women in standing up so courageously for the Wades, risking their lives in the Wade living room night after night, and then defying the grand jury and risking years in prison. Anne Braden traveled all over the country trying to raise the money for her husband's bail. Her parents, strong advocates for segregation, were ashamed of her, but they paid her bail and they cared for her children while she traveled. Finally, after seven months, with the help of the ACLU, Carl was bailed out. He filed an appeal, but the Kentucky courts refused to hear it because there was a case in front of the Supreme Court challenging state sedition laws. In April 1956, nearly two years after the bombing, the Supreme Court ruled that state sedition laws were unconstitutional. Carl's conviction was overturned. He went home, 
and LaRue and Louise's cases, along with the cases of the other three house guardians, were thrown out. This is Carl on his way home from prison. As a side note, the prosecutor of these witch hunts, A. Scott Hamilton, would kill himself five years later. How much was his suicide a result of these trials? In the famous musical Les Miserables, there's a law and order man, Inspector Javert. When Javert has to confront a higher moral code than the one to which he has dedicated his life, he jumps off a bridge. Did Mr. Hamilton also have difficulty reconciling his sense of duty with the nation's changing ideas about civil liberties? But all of the defendants are persona non grata in Louisville by now, their pictures having been in all the papers and their cases having been in the news for two years. Vernon and his roommate, I.O. Ford, moved together to California. The third man, Lou Lubka, moved to Nebraska, where he became a university professor of civil rights and a legendary peace activist. That's the mugshot of Lou. Lou would identify himself as a proud member of the Communist Party all of his life. Andrew Wade repaired his home but never lived in it. The Wades bought a house in the West End, and Louisville's housing would remain segregated until the 1960s. The Bradens, unemployed and unemployable, were hired by the Southern Conference Educational Fund, a nonprofit dedicated to the struggle for civil rights. And Anne wrote the bestseller, The Wall Between, about the bombing. But time passes, and today the Bradens are in the Kentucky Civil Rights Hall of Fame. The Anne Braden Institute for Social Justice Research, a program within the University of Louisville College of Arts and Sciences, was founded to honor the work and legacy of Anne. They officially opened on April 4, 2007. This is a contemporary Black Lives Matter gathering at the Carl Braden Memorial Center, which is the former Braden home in the West End. The building that currently houses the Braden Center was donated in order to sustain Carl and Anne's work of promoting justice in Louisville and the world at large. Anne founded the center in 1990. Robert Shatterley of Maine painted a series of portraits called Americans Who Tell the Truth. This is Anne Braden's quotation on the painting of her. Quote, as long as people of color can be written off as expendable and therefore acceptable victims of the most extreme inequities, none of the basic injustices in our society will be addressed. They will only get worse. Today there is a plaque at the location of the Wade House, and here is a picture of it with Steve Ebbs, a proud descendant of Andrew and Charlotte Wade. Did anything good come of the Wade House bombing? The Wade House bombing received national attention, and Ann Braden's travels to raise money also raised awareness all over the United States. Louisville, like other cities, was scrambling to desegregate their schools in, in 1955. Many believe that the racist debacle around the Wade House bombing and the national embarrassment it caused Kentucky were major factors in the relative smoothness of Louisville's school integration system. But what about LaRue and Louise? After her case was dismissed, LaRue moved to a town outside Louisville but still found it difficult to get work. She started to support herself with freelance writing. The record is a little hazy, but it seemed that the two women both moved to Philadelphia around 1955 after their case was thrown out. Louise got a job with the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom in Philadelphia. There's quite a few photos of Philadelphia in the Spiker archive, but at some point LaRue got restless. She bought a travel trailer and hauled it up to Maine, living in a campground in the summer of 1956. She would drive the camper down to Florida in the winter. Possibly this was a response to surviving a house bombing and then living with daily threats of having her apartment bombed. She could now pick up and move her home anywhere she wanted, anytime she wanted, and nobody would know where she was. By 1960, LaRue was a permanent resident of Southwest Harbor. I was unable to find a date for it, but Louise also moved to Maine, and she and LaRue lived in houses next door to each other up on Long Pond Road in Southwest Harbor. In 
Were they just older women who needed their own space, or did they live as neighbors because their arrest made them realize how vulnerable they were as women living with each other? It's much harder to claim that two women are a couple if they don't live in the same house. In any event, they both spent the rest of their lives far away from the front lines of the civil rights battles. Given the trauma of twice being driven out of her home state, the trauma of the arrests and indictments, the trauma of two years of waiting for a trial that could result in two decades in prison, and the trauma of daily hate mail and constant threats, it's a testimony to the resilience of these two women that they reinvented their lives in their mid-40s on one of the most beautiful spots on the planet. LaRue went on to become a deeply beloved member of the community here and a well-respected journalist. Her activism was honored. In 1991, Anne and Carl Braden, the three house guardians, Lou Lubka, Vernon Bowen, and I.O. Ford, all came up to Southwest Harbor where LaRue and Louise hosted a very private reunion of the Wade House Seven. While awaiting trial, LaRue wrote a book about abolitionist Elijah Lovejoy. Interestingly, LaRue chose to write about a Mainer. Lovejoy was born, born in Albion, Maine, and he went to what is now Colby College. A journalist deeply involved in the abolitionist movement, he had his presses destroyed four different times. The fourth time he was murdered, and the warehouse where the press was housed was burned down. This was a very personal book for LaRue, where she attributed thoughts and feelings to her protagonist. It was what we call a fictionalized biography. In the 1950s, there was no such thing. Publishers told her to write a biography or to write a novel, not both. So it was never published. This was also traumatic for LaRue. But I like to think that her affinity for Lovejoy brought her to Maine, and her identification with his life sustained her during her, her ordeal. I like to think that LaRue wrote her way to liberation. And I'll give the last word to Anne Braden. The first task of whites in these struggles is to be vocal and visible.